All right, if you guys would uh, stop the fellowship. I, uh, time got behind me, got, got past me this morning. I was enjoying uh, getting, walking around and seeing everyone. Didn't realize it was 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, but it is, and it's time to start. So I want to welcome all of you to the great First Baptist Church. Uh, it is great because God is our God, and God is always great. And uh, today, we're going to worship Him and, and honor Him, and, and I thank you that you're a part of it. I also want to thank those that are listening, those that will be listening uh, to our service uh, uh, on the Internet. Uh, a lot of folks have been listening recently, and I hope that, uh, that when you're not able to be here physically, that you'll be listening in that venue. Remember, on Wednesday night, it's 7, uh, 7. Uh, we're also, we also present a Wednesday night service, and uh, soon, when COVID begins to, to diminish again, we're going to start meeting again on Wednesday night and having full-fledged Sunday school on Sunday morning, and, uh, along with what we have now. So things are, things are, uh, are moving. Some things are moving very slowly. Uh, I hope by the end of the month, we'll have a final resolution to our insurance matters, and uh, you'll be able to... Uh, be, uh, you'll be aware of, of some of the basic work that's going to be done uh, in the, in the uh, repair of our facilities. Um, so be aware of a lot of things going on. I also will announce that uh, the business meeting we were going to have today, I hope you're not too disappointed, it will be moved until the 31st of January, the last Sunday of this month. Following the morning service, there will be a brief business meeting. It will not be today. Uh, so let's... Uh, Begin this morning's service with prayer. We want to. We need to pray. Uh, let's let's pray for our, for our nation. It is in dire strait. Um, our nation is changing. Our lives are going to change um, in some ways. And uh, I'm not sure the American way of life that you and I have taken for granted and enjoyed through the years will continue to be as it has been. Let's pray that God will uh, will intervene directly into our nation and uh, will work through all leaders, all of our government and that uh, His will be done above all things. Uh, let's pray for the church. Pray for God's will to be done uh, in the life of this church as we approach uh, days of great change. Uh, let's pray for our city and uh, pray that revival will come and that, that God will do just marvelous and wonderful things to His glory. Let's bow together. Father, we love You and we praise You for the day that You've given. Lord, we are so blessed to be Americans in the United States. To live in a country where we have been free and are free and to, to choose our, our vocations and to live our lives. Thank you for the prosperity of our land and for the fact that, that we have food to eat, clothes to wear, places to sleep. Lord, thank you for every little and every large blessing that are ours. We pray for our nation today. I pray that uh, our elected leaders will be submissive to your will. I pray that your will will be paramount and be accomplished ever how. But that you will be the God of our nation. And Lord, that our nation will be run on Judeo-Christian truth. And on no other religions, tenets, or in the name of unknown gods. We pray, Father, that our nation and Christians within it will return to you in such faith and devotion that, that we will, for the sake of our land... For the sake of our children and grandchildren, for, the, for your glory and honor, that we will stand firm in the faith that you have given to us to live by. Bless our church, Father, as we worship today. May we sing to, to your glory. May, may your word be preached clearly and plainly. I pray for the hearers. Father, the word can be preached, but the people must hear. And I pray that you will open our ears and our hearts. And help us to hear what you would have us to know today. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our failures. Help us to learn today to become better than we are. To become better and to do more than we've ever done. Father, help us today. I pray to do our very best. As we honor your name and worship you. We ask you, Father, all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.
I hope I, I ask you this morning to get very personal. Uh, when I say that, I want you to get very personal with yourself, but yourself and your relationship with God. And I'm going to tra- share a very important message, one that is not easily presented, uh, but it is a powerful word from God in Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 7, and Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 6 is part of it too, but we're going we're gonna to look at some, several verses. Now, it's going to be very important. That, that I, ho- I hope you have your Bibles, that you open your Bibles to Romans 5, and then as we go through in the brief sermon message today, uh, you will be able to look at the verses. You need very much to look into the book and see them. Uh, Romans chapter 5 begins, there is there, uh, it, I'm sorry, that's Romans 8. In Romans 5, therefore being justified by, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you at peace with God? Paul says, being justified by faith, we are at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, we will get there in a few moments. Therefore, therefore means because of what's just been said, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Oh, what what a group of verses. What three powerful chapters in Romans that Paul gives to us. Now, I want to begin by saying the last words the folks in Houston at Nassau want to hear from outer space, you know what they are? Houston, we have a problem. Well, the last words you want to be able, you want to say to God in your Christian walk, God, I have a problem. I have a problem with my walk. I have a problem in my church. Our church, Father, has a problem. If that be the case, those are not the words We really want to hear. Uh, The fact is, in the Christian life, troubles come. And we have to address them personally. There are times when a hurricane will damage the building. There are times when we've learned a pandemic will come and and do great havoc to the church's schedule and, and routine. But I want you to hear what I'm saying this morning. That... The fact is, in the Christian life, we all are building a testimony. We have a testimony about when we got saved. But our testimony continues until we die. And if someone were to ask you this morning to give your testimony, most probably your testimony would be about when you got saved and how you got saved. But our testimony doesn't stop there. It continues and continues. In Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul, he gives his testimony. What a testimony. One of the most dramatic conversions, probably the most dramatic conversion any Christian will ever have. He got saved on the Damascus Road. And on more than one occasion, he gives his testimony. He talks about his conversion. Now I want to ask you, when were you saved? Young people, old folk. Where were you at when you got saved? What changes in your life has taken place since you got saved? Has there been any changes? What has happened in your life since the day of your conversion? If like me, you were saved at age 11 and now you're where I am now, what's happened between age 11 and age now? Hopefully there are a lot of things that have happened. Hopefully there is a growth in testimony. Changes come when we come to Christ. And in the process of those ongoing changes, sometimes we radio back to God, God, I'm having a problem. God, there's something going awry. But the Bible says that if any person, is in, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. God brings change into our life. I have to confess to you, when I was 11, not a whole lot of change took place. I was only 11. If you were saved at age 6 or 7, you didn't have a dramatic change in your life. 
But the Bible changes in our life everything when we're saved. We go from being dead to being alive. What great change that is. We go from living in the world dead to living in the Spirit of God on the way to heaven. God changes our life. Don't you love the old hymn? What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I had sought. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. If Jesus has come into your heart, if you are saved, young or old, then God has brought changes into your life. Paul is our, is our great example. Paul writes the book of Romans. Paul describes his testimony one time. He says, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of the Pharisee. I was somebody in the Jewish faith. Now he's, he's been changed. He's now a Christian. There was a time in his life he, he would describe that he hated Christians. He didn't use the word, but he, he hated them. And now he is one of them. There was a time in his life when he would arrest Christians only because they were Christian. He would imprison them because he had the authority. He would put some of them to death, and he probably wanted death to all Christians. What a change in my life since Jesus has come into my heart. He has gone from all of that to being the greatest evangelist and the greatest writer of Scripture we will ever know. Paul has a testimony. Do you have a testimony? But in Paul's building of his testimony, he had some troubles along the way. I don't know if I've ever shared those troubles the way I'm going to today. If you are genuine in your faith, you will say, since the day of your conversion, you've had challenges and troubles along the way. You haven't always pleased God. You sometimes have failed Him and yourself and others. That's what we're going to talk about today. Paul's ongoing testimony is really an incredible testimony. But I believe what needs to be said is that Paul, that great writer of Scripture, the one who said to die is gain but to live is Christ, the one who said I am ready for my departure, I have finished the race, he was a man who had some great struggles in his life. I have a feeling that, it, that when Paul, the, who once had been Saul, would lay his head to go to sleep at night, maybe every night the first thing he saw was a man named Stephen being stoned to death. Now I dare you to say, because you got saved, you don't remember what you did wrong in the past. I'm sure that Paul, now that he is a believer, is living with great regret because he remembers with, with a regret and with great horror and shame how Stephen preached the gospel, and in doing so, was stoned at his permission? How could he close his eyes at night and, and not remember the lovely families that he divided because he took the mother or the father or both mother and father away from the family to prison? He had to live with that all the rest of his life. Paul had struggles in his life. What he had done before he got saved could not be undone. There are things in your life that you will never, ever undo. You can't undo them just because God has come into your life and has wrought wonderful changes. The past is the past. God can erase your sin, forgive your sin, move your sin far as the east is from the west, but you and I, don't we have a problem? We remember them, don't we? And they come back to haunt us and we... We ask years after conversion, God, forgive me, after we've prayed for forgiveness so many times. And he has forgiven us, but we have the memory we remember. I believe in Romans 5, 6, and 7, and 8, Paul has a spiritual epiphany. I, I want you to get into his mind, get into his heart. I believe that, that, that as he writes these books, these verses that I've, we're going to look at today, that that. That it, well, it's a book that's never been read, read by anybody. Paul is just now writing it, okay? Paul is writing what God is revealing to him. Now listen, listen. He's not writing from his own intellect. He has not gone into his study 
and discovered what he's writing in order to write it. God Almighty is breathing out the Scripture. All Scripture is inspired, breathed out by God. And so listen to this. When we read Romans 5, when we will read Romans 7, we're reading what God Almighty has just told the Apostle Paul. And as he does so, Paul is going to have an epiphany. He is going to have an awakening. God is revealing to him the truth. Paul is having trouble, but God is going to address the trouble as he writes the scripture that God presents to him. Paul will do what you need to do today. What did he do? Paul is going to do as he writes chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, he's going to do what you and I, all of us, need to do. I, I, I'm saying all this believing it's the word of God as I, I prayed through it and as God's led me in it. I believe that the Apostle Paul here opens the dark closet of his life and reveals the truth about himself. He's the evangelist. He's the writer of Scripture. He is Paul. But he's going to say, I'm not who you think I am. He's going to admit that what he ought to do, he's not doing. And what he should not do, he so often does. Is there any verse of Scripture you and I relate to better? Paul opens the closet. And this spiritual leader says, I, I'm just not as good as you think I am. And, uh, and as he opens the door and, and, and gives his ongoing testimony, we get an understanding. Listen to this. We get an understanding of the glory of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you and I open the closet and we are honest and open and humble before God, that's when we understand what God's done for us. Do you hear what I'm saying? Is it making sense? When we are open and honest before God and we say, God, I'm having trouble, that's when God makes known His amazing grace and His glorious love. Paul is going to begin, I believe, at, at, at this point in his life to praise God more, to love God greater, to work for God with greater sacrifice and dedication because as he continues his understanding and is open and honest before God, he is just going to he is just going to have an incredible experience before him. Well, God has changed you, hadn't he? But do you deal with sin? Do you deal with doubts and struggles in your life? Are you in the habit of revealing your sin to everyone in the church? Are you, are you in the habit of, of, of confessing and, and sharing your testimony, all the problems and failures and limitations of your life? Is there a part of your life when you leave church today that back here in the back of your mind, some, you're troubled because you know you know you haven't done good enough. How many of you have done good enough? The fact is, young and old, we haven't done good enough. We're trying, aren't we? Aren't you trying? I believe you are. I know I'm trying. Are we good enough? The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He's not talking to the lost world. He's talking to a group of believers. Paul has never acknowledged it that I remember. And in Romans 7, he's going to acknowledge that he, the great apostle Paul, has a problem. And because he acknowledges that problem, he's going to come through it and he's going to celebrate what God has done in his life. Let me explain to you what he's done. Let me tell you, let me put it in this outline form at this point. Number one, Paul is at peace with God. Paul says there is there, he says, uh, he says uh, that he says, uh, therefore we have been justified by faith. We are, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is saved. He is a child of God. He is at peace with God. He knows it. He says to the Thessalonians later, he says, May the peace of God, which keep uh, which passes all understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Paul spoke about the peace that God gave him. Are you at peace with God? Paul was at peace with God. Uh, he, he says in Romans 5 uh, uh, that we are justified in order to have that peace with God. And now I believe that when he realizes he's at peace with God now at this time in his life, he can close his eyes at night and he can sleep. I believe he can close his eyes and not see Stephen anymore. I believe he's, he realizes he's been truly forgiven. He's been truly cleansed. He's no longer the sinner Saul. He's the apostle Paul. He doesn't remember those families that he hurt so badly because he's at peace with God. You have to work through your life and trust him. And by faith, God brings peace. Paul was at war with God. You know that. Before he was saved, he had declared war on the Christian faith. In Romans 5, Paul says we were ungodly. Paul was ungodly. He says we were the enemies of God. Paul was the enemy. He says we were all guilty before God. Paul was guilty he says, we were all sinners again. He says, there were none of us, in Romans, he says, none of us who sought after God. Now, I want to tell you something now that may be in my mind, for me, myself, one of the most profound truths, one of the greatest truths. Paul, with all these troubles of his, of his life that he's going through, he comes to the awareness that no one has sought, sought after God. And I think it came to him then. You know what came to him? It was God who sought him. Paul, Saul was down the Damascus Road doing the work of a Hebrew and a Pharisee. He was going to kill another Stephen. He was going to split another family. He was going to abolish Christianity another step along the way. His last thought would he, that he would ever become a Christian he wasn't seeking God, but suddenly, do you, see, you know what happened? Suddenly a light shone from heaven. He was blinded and he heard the voice of our Lord. God sought him. Can I, now listen, you got it, folks, please don't ever forget this. The only reason you're here today, the only reason you can call yourself a Christian is because God sought you. God called you. Don't ever take it for granted. Don't ever think that you've done God a favor by choosing Him. You don't choose God. God has chosen you. And listen, do you know what that means? For Paul, you know what I think it meant for Paul here? As he's writing in this context of his troubles as a Christian, he's remembering, hey, I didn't choose Him. He chose me. And if He chose me, I'm okay. He didn't choose me because I was good enough. He didn't choose me because I was going to straighten everything out. He sought me. Why would he seek me if he's not going to keep me? That's shouting words. I've lived a long time. I've pastored for 50 years. I have never been satisfied with my walk. I have never been good enough. God sought me, and I don't have to be too much pressure. Do you hear me, young people? God sought you because he loves you. And, uh, and Paul comes to that great, great understanding. He is at peace with God in Romans 5. But then there's a second aspect to his testimony. This is his ongoing testimony. Listen, you've got to hear it. Paul was at war with himself, even when he was at peace with God. I think most of us have been there. Most of us have somewhere along the way been at war with ourselves. Man, I don't want to. I better not do it. I better not do it. I, I, I better not. You know? And you lose the battle. There are times we are at war with ourselves. Paul didn't ever say those words, but it's obvious here. In Romans 7, now Romans 5, we're at peace. Romans 7, he describes the war he had been in. He admits his problems. And now, what if we were to take a few moments and stand up and describe our own sin, our own failure, our own struggles? I don't know what Paul's were. 
But Paul wasn't a perfect man. In spite of who he is, he was a man. Maybe he was a lazy man. Maybe he had some lazy tendencies. Maybe he had a lazy streak. Maybe Paul had a temper. <laughs> I've always said a man with no temper can't get a whole lot done. But a man that can't control a temper can't get anything done. Maybe Paul had a temper he sometimes couldn't control. Maybe Paul judged people. You know, have any of us ever done that? Maybe he criticized people too much. Maybe he jumped to conclusions. Maybe Paul had some hate in his heart. Maybe he was dealing with hate and he was troubled by his former Jewish allies because of the way they were doing as he had once done. Maybe, maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe Paul would stump his toe in a rock. Don't lie and say you didn't. Maybe Paul would stub his toe and say something we would be shocked to hear Paul say. Paul is not God. We've made him out to be in a lot of ways. Maybe there were times in Paul's life when he would long for the... Maybe there were times he wished he could go back to the old life and do all that he once did. Maybe Paul had a drinking problem. No, I don't think. There's all kinds of sins and all kinds of things that could have been plaguing him. What's your problem? The point of the message is that we all have problems. You can't sit in the seat of judgment over someone else unless you don't have any problems. You can't judge someone for their sin unless you don't have any sin. But Paul summarizes his problem for us as God manifest to him the reality of his life. When he opens the door, he says in Romans 7, 14, look at it. Romans 7, verse 14, he says, the law of God is spiritual. And my translation says, but I'm not. You know, our biggest problem at First Baptist Church today is we're not spiritual enough. We're mighty physical here. We're very carnal here. We do things man's way, for man's sake. We don't do that much God's way for the glory of God. Paul says the law of God is spiritual, but I'm not. That's a problem. Look at verse 15, Romans 7, look at it. He said, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. Paul says, I, I know I ought not do it, but that's what I do. He says, I know I ought to do this, but I don't do it. Have you ever? Have you ever not done what you knew you were supposed to do? Have you ever done something you knew you really weren't supposed to do? Paul, who has peace with God, is realizing because of his openness and honesty that he's not where he ought to be, and you aren't either, nor am I. Can you relate to him? Romans, look at verse 18. Romans 7. He says, for I know. Now, again, this is all coming to Paul right now. He's never said this before. He says, I know that in me, in the, fle in the parenthesis, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Is that not our, our testimony? Paul says, in me, there's nothing good. I live in this body of flesh. God has given me eternal life, but I'm still in this body. And in this body, he says, there's nothing good. But he says, there is a desire in me. There is a desire in me. Is there one in you? There is a will to do the right. But I have a hard time finding out how. That is the testimony of so many. If only I could figure out how to do what I know I must do. He goes on, look at verse 19. 
for the good that I would do. He says it again very plainly. I don't do it. The evil which I would not do, that do I. Can you imagine? Paul just said he does evil things. Don't put Paul on a pedestal. Paul's a hero of our faith, but he's a man. He says, the evil which I would not do, that I do. Now, I'm not giving anybody an excuse to do evil. I'm making known in the scripture how Paul addressed the problem and built his testimony to the glory of God. But he couldn't do it until he acknowledged that he did evil things and that he didn't do the good thing. You and I have to open the dark closet of our lives and we have to be honest before God. Have you ever been honest with Him? We have to be humble before God. You can't confess your problems and your sins without humility. And the problem with us is that we are so prideful that we don't want to admit we're ever wrong. A portion of the message originally had been uh, to do with narcissism. And narcissism is one of the underlying problems in our land today. It is growing. A true narcissist will never say he's wrong, will never say I'm sorry. For a true narcissist, it's always about them. Every sociopath starts out as a narcissist and does not see wrong in what they're doing. You wonder how people can be so bad. That's why. But we're not narcissists, I pray. And yet even we who are not narcissists have a hard time saying, I'm sorry. We have a hard time saying, I was wrong. But Paul says it. He says it of himself. The good I would do, I don't. The evil that I would not do, I don't. Come to a time in his Christian walk. Oh my, my time is out. When he's at the brink, I believe he could be at the brink of giving up. Y'all, y'all bear with me because we don't have anything else to do today. Paul is about to give up here. Do you hear what I'm saying? Is it possible that's why so many Christians leave the church? Why Christianity is on the decline? Because people give up. They don't understand that God hasn't changed them completely and that they still struggle with things in their life. He is at the door of giving up, but God will not let him give up. Paul was in a hopeless, desperate situation. What I don't, what I want to do, I don't. What evil I don't want to do, I do. God, what do I do? Well, here he says it. Here's how he said it. Romans 7, 24. Look at verse 24. Who? Who shall deliver me? You know what that means? He can't deliver himself. We try to do it ourselves. I'm going to be the best pastor. I'm going to do it myself. Never made it. I'm going to be the best. I've never made it. Have you? He says, who will deliver me? He's admitting failure. I can't do it. I can't do what I want to do. I can't stop doing what I don't want to do. Who will deliver me from this body of flesh? Who will deliver me from this body of death? The answer to that question doesn't come from Paul's study. It doesn't come from his intellect. It comes from God. It comes from God alone. In verse 25, God gives him the answer and he gives it to all of us. He says, thank you, God. Thank you, God, because you have delivered me through Jesus Christ, my Lord. His testimony began in Damascus, on the Damascus Road. It didn't stop there. It is continuing now and he's saying to the world, for all the ages to come. Now listen, he has just said for you, to you and me in the 21st century. He has said it to every believer between the time he wrote it until now. He has been honest before everybody. <laughs> he has been honest and open to all. And he testifies. He gives God the glory. Thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ, my Lord, I have been delivered. And I am being delivered. That is our testimony. It's not about what God. You know, God is delivering you. 
Don't give up. Overcome that sin because God will help you to do it. God will deliver you. Don't give up on the problem. Thank God who delivers you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is our testimony. It is what God is doing in your life today. And First Baptist Church to Quincy, we need to see God doing this today. It's not about what He's done. It's about what He's doing in my life, in your life, and in the life of this church. I'm going to close. I'm going to close with the third thing. It's very brief, very brief. But it's the most important, possibly. Romans 8 hadn't got there yet. Starting in verse 5, he's writing all the way through and comes to Romans chapter 8. Now, in chapter 7, the whole chapter has to do with the problems that we just talked about. And he's answered the question, who will deliver him from this body of sin and death? And he, say, he thanks God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is our deliverer. Then he says, by the way, most theologians don't believe chapter 8 and chapter 7 ought to be divided. Chapter 7 and chapter 8 are together. He says, therefore, God says to him, therefore, therefore, oh, do you read it? Look at it. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I have a strong, strong feeling that Paul needed to know that he was not condemned. I have needed to know in my life that I am not condemned. And I bet you, you are too, in a place in your life or have been where you you want to know that you're not condemned by the grace and the mercy of God. Paul says, therefore, I'm at, being justified by faith, I'm at peace. But God, I got all these troubles. I don't do what I ought to do. I do what I ought not do. Who's going to deliver me from all this mess? Who's going to save me in this, old, this lifetime of struggles? Oh, it's God through Jesus Christ our Lord, who will deliver us. Therefore, we're not condemned. Therefore, we're alive. We're not condemned. We're not innocent. But our sentence has been paid for, and we're no longer condemned. I, I could go another hour talking about condemnation here. See, we were already condemned, according to John 3, 17. But when Jesus saved us, we're no longer condemned. How do you feel this morning? Do you feel better because you're not condemned? Do you still wonder if you're condemned or not condemned? What is your testimony this morning? I rebuke Satan in Jesus' name from your life and the life of this great church so that you and I can overcome our struggles, overcome our weaknesses, overcome our flesh, and do what we ought to do and stop doing what we ought not do. And in the process, giving him all the glory. Because you see, our salvation is from Him. And guess what else? Our salvation continues to be from Him even when things aren't right in our life. I, uh, I may be the only person, I don't know, who benefited from this message today. But I want to tell you, God bless my heart because I haven't been what I ought to be. Have you? But in my struggles, I have been delivered. I have been delivered. I have been delivered. Chuck, you've been delivered. Delivered. To the glory of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we bow before you this morning. In the midst of thinking about our own testimony. Lord, I, I know when Paul was writing the scripture, it wasn't coming from him, it came from you. And as it came from you, he was learning it just like we are now. And Father, your scripture is so relative to our life. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us, choosing us. And Lord, thank you for delivering us from the law of sin and death. Thank you for, for removing the sign of 
condemnation from our life and allowing us to live, to live not just today, but forever. Father, may these words you've shared with us today dwell and live in our hearts. Satan cannot have victory in us, Father. May he be rebuked from the lives of all the hearers today. And may we celebrate what you have done and are doing every day in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to have an invitation this morning. Maybe you want to come to the altar. Maybe you need to come to the altar and just get with God and talk to him. Maybe today you can come and say, God, thank you for delivering me. Thank you for not condemning me. Maybe today you know you've never trusted Christ and you're still living under condemnation. But for a few moments, the invitation is open for you to respond, to come talk to me, pray with me, or come to the altar and talk to him. Thank you all for being here today. I love Sunday mornings. I love the 10 o'clock service. I hope you do too. Uh, I hope you enjoy coming to fellowship together and, and, and singing and hearing a sermon even. And I hope the sermon made an impact in your life today. Aren't you glad that Paul came out of the closet? Aren't you glad that he said what he said because it helps us to understand ourselves better? And I say come out of the closet. That's just a term, you know. But, but you know what I think we ought to do when we go home today? Maybe we ought to open our spiritual closet up. And just say, God, I know I've not done what I ought to do. And I know, God, there are things in my life I'm doing that I will not do. And just praise him for delivering us, okay? Um, any word from anybody before we go? I want to... Okay. Okay, the personnel and the... Is it the committee on committees? or Whoever wants to come. Yeah, we're open here. Uh, so that meeting will take place. Um, 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 oh, I was going to say, Toby, I, I want you all to know that Toby Leger, he's going to be here for the next hour, maybe two, getting the service that we've just done.
prepared so that people won't have a problem hearing it at 12. Some of you at home, Peggy, I know you've had her trouble hearing it sometimes because of the way the internet goes. But when he gets through it at this, another hour or so, it'll be ready to go. After that, he and I are going to take Wednesday night service. We usually do it on Tuesday or Wednesday, but we're going to do it today. And he's going to take between now and Wednesday to make sure that, that taping is good. He, he takes my badness and, and makes it a lot better. He's amazing at what he does. But he will, <laughs> he, will, he will work on it for several hours. There's been all-nighters he's done to get ready for what he's doing in our church. The new church, the new day, here's what I'm saying, demands that we have church outside the building. It will be that way forever. And the churches that don't do what he's helping us to do, they will cease to be. Whether you like it or not, whether you ever listen to a sermon on, on, the, on the Facebook, which I don't want to even mention, the Facebook, or YouTube, which I'd rather mention, whether you ever do it or not, there are going to be, how many people listened last Wednesday? You know, off the top of your head? Around 200? And I'm not, we don't have any picketing yet outside. Um, today, we will, uh, when, when Brenda did her service on Wednesday night, there were, there's probably been five or 600 by now. What he's doing today is as important as leading worship, and preaching the sermon. Because that takes the, the worship and takes the sermon to everybody else that aren't here. And, and some people will listen that just don't want to come to church. Maybe they'll get right and come to church one day soon. A lot of folks are listening because they, they're afraid to come because of COVID. And so I just I want you all to know this guy is giving of himself and serving the Lord. And I love him for who he is and appreciate God for what he does. So you all let him know too. Anybody else got a word before we go? 31st, we have our business meeting. We'll elect two committees, two search committees. And, um, and there's another matter that we'll be discussing as well. All right? I want to go home. It's only 11 o'clock. You want to do it again? No? Bye. Don't forget to leave your money. Leave your money. <laughs>